I mentioned how you, you can have these, these critical points and sort of non-normal behavior. So uh, just looking at the, the PDF of, of a particular outcome, a random variable could be in the stock market, how much, uh, how much is the daily fluctuation per day? So this is a log normal distribution, meaning that uh, whatever this, that this random variable is defined on the x-axis, like I said, it could be daily fluctuations of stocks. This is sampled not from n uh, mu sigma squared, meaning normal, but it's the log of, of the normal distribution. Uh, it looks like this, and this is that fat tail effect, meaning that, you know, in a normal distribution, I would have the, you know, I would fall off to basically zero probability down here. This has a longer tail. So out here, I have these relatively huge events with, with not an in, insignificant probability. Like in this drawing, uh, this is a very, um, very unlikely event, and it still has a 1% chance of occurring, it looks like about in this light blue line, uh, which is pretty high, actually. Um, I, I talked about stable distributions before. There was, anyone ever heard of LTCM? If you haven't, that was, um, it was a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. They, they were actually a precursor. You could have known a little bit some of the problems that happened in the global financial crisis because this, co this uh, uh, yeah, company called LTCM Hedge Fund actually had a couple Nobel Prize economists on their team. They were making bets around what's called reversion to the mean um, and statistical arbitrage, which means that you know, if, if something looked out of whack, you, know, you assume that something has a normal distribution. Well, if all of a sudden I come in and I find that the random variable is way out on, the, on one of the tails of the bell curve, assuming that it's going to revert back to the mean, then I can make a bet that it is going to finally go back towards that center, kind of center of gravity point. Um, they were wrong. They had a cascading failure from, a, from what's also called a black swan event, a fat tail event, which was the... Um, the currency crisis in, in Russia at the time. Um, so anyway, that, that was sort of an unpredictable event. Now, very interesting modeling uh, work has been done to, to analyze and, and describe what I call self-organized criticality. A very good um, sort of, well, it's not only a mental model, it's a mathematical model, was developed by a scientist named Perbach. So this, this experiment was called the, or is called the, the Perbach sand pile. So I mentioned that the, that systems that are complex have, you know, that they're resilient in the sense you can keep on putting an input, keep on putting an input. And then all of a sudden I have these essentially an avalanche effect. So it turns out that now look at this drawing here on the right. This is showing the, the avalanche size, and this is a, a, a PDF. So as you can see, you can actually have very, very large avalanche sizes with some degree, it's like about 1% probability. So again, showing that fat tail effect. Um, and scientists have used this Perbach sand, sand pile um, to come to actually reproduce these PDFs. And it turns out that they're very close uh, or they're, they're very good models for approximating these types of tipping point effects in complex systems. Okay, and then I mentioned interconnectedness, and it turns out that, you know, this uh, the recent virus uh, dynamics it is, you know, some of the implications here are, or some of the effects of it are because of a complex system interactions. Uh, just the fact that you have this, this pandemic, the way that it spreads and all that, and the network connections, and it's um, in a relation to the health system. And we actually have a student, I won't, I won't, uh, steal his thunder, but I know we have a student, a group leader, who told me that he's doing a, a, a queuing analysis that, that will actually show some of this uh, modeling of, of the hospital system, which would be very cool. But um, one of the models that's using pandemic spread is called susceptible infected or recovered, the SIR model. Uh, so the idea is, and you may have heard of this if you're following the, the pandemic spread, there's a, and actually there was a paper that was written by Los Alamos, which was dealt with finding the transmissibility of the COVID-19 virus. Um, and this, what, what, what they talked about, you may have heard in the media, it called, it's called r not, but essentially that, that is how many people, like a, on average, uh, a person who's infected, how many people do they, do they affect? So a transmissibility of two means that for a given person who's infected, they'll infect two others, 
those infect two others. So basically, this has an exponential growth. Now, then you've heard of this, okay, you got this, this exponential growth, and people have talked about flattening the curve. How is the curve actually flattened? Well, the whole reason, or the, the reason that it can be flattened is because it turns out that this R0 is not intrinsic. It's not intrinsic to the COVID-19 virus. It's, it's because of the, or it's an effect of the interconnectedness of society. So in other words, as people become infected or if they've already recovered and they're immune, then uh, these, these people that I have in blue here, they're no longer spreading. So imagine that if this, if this person in, uh, tries to infect this person who's blue, all of a sudden I'm gonna cut off, I'm gonna prune the rest of the network here. So it's not gonna grow. So if you, if you do a model, a simulation of this using this model, you'll get this bell-shaped curve. Well, here's the thing, though. If I wanted to look at this in more detail and I really wanted to model the interconnection, well, let's just say if I want to model the, the disease dynamics, I could using a mathematical model like this. But in order to really um, go in and say, okay, well, but what is going to – what's another way that I can modify this tree? What's another way that society could change the susceptibility number, the R naught? Well, I could do it through various social controls, whether it be quarantines or not, using train systems and then um, say disinfecting them every now and then. So what how could I model that? And the way that you would do that is through agent-based modeling. 